Alright, so with Habakkuk chapter 2, um, there's 20 verses, we're going to get into all of those. Uh, I did kind of an overview of the, the book of Habakkuk uh, last week uh, before getting briefly into chapter 1. So in the way of overview for tonight, I'm only going to mention, uh, show the timeline once again, uh, just so you can kind of get a visual in your mind uh, uh, when Habakkuk uh, was um, prophesying that, that the years you can see at the bottom of the timeline and see the other uh, minor and major prophets that he was contemporary with that lived alongside him in the same day and age. And then as we went through uh, chapter 1 last week, there were a couple questions that we found Habakkuk asking the Lord. Um, and there was kind of a pattern if you went through, maybe your study Bible has a chapter heading or headings in the chapter. Um, mine did, and it kind of started off with you know, Habakkuk's question and then the Lord's reply. And then Habakkuk's second question and then the Lord's reply. Um, so those were, and the two questions that he had uh, that were kind of asked and answered partially answered, I guess, um, in chapter 1, we're going to see more of it here in chapter 2. But the first question that Habakkuk asked was, you know, why does the evil in Judah go unpunished? So he was constantly made aware of and saw and knew of uh, evil that was going on. Or another way to phrase that might be, why do the wicked continue to prosper? And, um, and again, these questions are not specific or unique to Habakkuk's day and age. We could ask these same questions here and now. You know, why does evil in the United States go unpunished? Or why do the wicked prosper still today? Uh, we see stories of this often uh, in our local community and, and worldwide as well. The second question he asks is, how can a just God, a righteous God, use a wicked nation like Babylon to punish his chosen people? Uh, so that's a great question. and. Um, God even said to Habakkuk, you know, if I, there, there's going to be a, a work that I'm going to do, uh, and if I were to try to tell you plainly, you wouldn't really even believe me. Um, so he goes on to explain everything uh, that Habakkuk needs to know about, in a vision, that Habakkuk needs to know about the Babylonians and how truly wicked they are. Um, and at, remember at this point in time, uh, a lot of people of Judah and Habakkuk already know certain wickedness because it had been around and existed in Habakkuk's time because Assyria is now on their way down and kind of out of uh, power. The Babylonians are going to uh, continue to, to conquer them and the Babylonians will rise to power and take over from kind of the, the wicked rule and the wicked things that the Assyrians had done. So that's kind of where we left off. We The Lord kind of replied to Habakkuk's second question and now in verse 1 of chapter 2, we're going to see Habakkuk's sort of kind of taking a step back. And you'll see what I mean here in just a second. Uh, verse 1, I will stand in my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. So I will stand in my watch and set myself on the rampart. This kind of shows Habakkuk's Habakkuk's faith when he says he'll watch and see what the Lord will say to him. Uh, in the complete Jewish Bible, um, depending on what app you have, or maybe you have the actual translation in your lap, but uh, in that, if you go to Blue Letter Bible, the Bible Gateway, and most apps will have a lot of different versions that you can go to and thumb through and look at. But the K or CJB, complete Jewish Bible, where it says, and you can see I have it highlighted in the red text here, in the New King James, it says, he will say to me. But in the complete Jewish Bible, the phrase is written as, he will say through me. Or another way to think of this might be, as he will say in me. Uh, maybe a little bit more of a, an accurate translation there in the sense that, you know, isn't it the case that when we do hear the Lord's voice, it's in us that we hear that voice. Um, no one here that I'm aware of has probably ever heard the Lord speaking to you audibly, out loud. So that's the to me kind of has that sense. You know, if I'm talking to you right now. I'm not talking in you or through you. I'm talking to you. Um, 
but in a different version, the New King James, it says that he will say in me or through me. So that, that's really a kind of a deeper understanding or meaning. And again, remember, he's seeing all of these different things in a vision. So the Lord is really speaking in Habakkuk. And then he goes on to say that he is ready to be corrected or reproved as well. Implying that Habakkuk possibly even feels that he may have said too much in asking the questions that he asked. Um, you know, kind of in hindsight all the time, we have um, second thoughts often about, you know, how we handle the conversation or discussion with somebody or that email we hit send to before we were calmed down. Um, oftentimes we just have, again, second thoughts. And Habakkuk may be going through this. Um, so, not that asking questions is bad, because asking questions, I think, is usually always a great thing. Uh, we can always get in trouble maybe on how we ask the question or what attitude we ask the question in. But truly, if we ask a question in the right way, uh, uh, truly looking for an answer that's going to be beneficial for all involved, then asking questions are good. So Habakkuk probably felt that he was complaining, maybe, or possibly um, unjustly uh, accusing God of using the Babylonians against God's chosen people. So that is the kind of the sense that I, I see or feel here from this uh, chapter 2, verse 1, is that Habakkuk is just taking a step back now and saying, wow, I wonder if I overstepped my bounds with the way I, I asked these questions of the Lord. Uh, so now he's saying, okay, Lord, if I did, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm ready for the correction, I'm ready for the reproof, uh, lay it on me. So let's see what happens now. Verse 2, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. So here we see that immediately, verse 2, the Lord answers Habakkuk. He responds to him. The Lord says, Write this down, write this vision down that I've shared with you. And thank God that he did. I mean, that's 2,000 years later. We're able to sit here now and reread it and share it um, because Habakkuk took the time through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through God speaking in him, uh, that he wrote it down. And he made it plain and understandable and clear. Uh, and, and, I, and I like it that the, the actual scripture says, and make it plain on these tablets. Don't write in superfluous terms or something that's going to be a, an analogy or a metaphor or something that might be misconstrued. Make it plain and make it clear, is what he says. So that he may run who reads it. So I, ideally, the, the, the idea here is, at least what I think, is that those that read these words will then possibly want to run and share it. So that he may run who reads it. So he's going to read these words of Habakkuk and then he's going to, uh, I don't know, take a copy of the words maybe at some point in time when they had scribes to rewrite it. Um, but this is, you see, making it on tablets. So this is a long time ago. Um, but they had writing that they could write on the animal skin and so forth. He would run and share it with others. Verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak. And it will not lie. Through it, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So, an appointed time um, speaks of a determined time in God's eyes. Uh, oftentimes, and even Habakkuk doesn't have has no idea what this appointed time may be. How it could be a few minutes, a few hours, days, months, years, and so on, decades even, uh, before this appointed time may come to fruition. So the vision given to Habakkuk is from a point in time in the future, and it will be accurate. The Lord says, it will not lie. Though it may tarry, it's going to happen, and it will surely come true. Um, so it may seem like a long time, but it will come. So Christians have been waiting for Jesus' return now. Um, you know, we use the rough term, average, or a rounded off number of roughly 2,000 years. But he will not tarry either. Uh, he will return. That's what we call the, the second coming. Uh, so what does this term tarry mean? There's been books written on this, and you hear the, f the 
phrase, it's kind of an old English phrase, I think, because I don't hear it too much in modern language. Um, but tarry means to delay or to be tardy in acting or doing. So basically the way we're thinking of it is, you know, the Lord is just delaying, but on purpose. And how do we know this? Um, verse 9 of 2 Peter chapter 3 kind of explains this to us. And also realize before I read this verse that the delay of the Lord is for the salvation of the lost. And that's what the 2 Peter 3 verse 9 is really saying. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Meaning He's going to make sure that uh, what He wants to happen will happen before He returns. So He's tarrying, He's delaying for a purpose. As some count slackness, but His long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, and then the red text, but that all should come to repentance. So there's a, a, a reason that it's taken 2,000 plus years for Jesus to make His uh, second appearing happen. He's waiting for the completion of the, the Gentiles, to, for everyone to be called and to respond before the rapture happens, essentially, and then after the rapture will be the second coming. Do you remember how uh, Peter uh, told us that with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years? And that's actually, coincidentally, the very previous verse to this one. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So imagine Jesus coming back tomorrow, and one of us, or somebody, sees him somewhere on the streets of Kernersville, and says, wow, we Christians have been waiting for you to come back for over 2,000 years. What took you so long? And... Jesus could easily reply and say, what do you mean? I only ascended two days ago. Two days, 2,000 years. So, so how, how could that possibly be true? And uh, this is, I'm going to go off topic here a little bit just because Einstein, which we've all heard of, came up with this theory of relativity. And if it were accurate, this would explain Jesus ascending two days ago showing up tomorrow, 2,000 rounded off years, 2,000 years later, and him thinking, I was only gone two days, what do you mean, why did it take so long? And why did it take so long in our earth time compared to his time away? So again, Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, I'm an engineer, so I thought this was interesting, and I thought it may help somebody kind of connect the dots on maybe why two days could possibly be 2,000 years. So does anybody know what the speed of light travels at? 186,282 miles per second. Awesome. Round it off, 186,000 miles per second. So now we travel at 55 miles an hour. So imagine 186,000 miles per second. So when you turn on the light switch, boom, light is here. 186,000 miles per second. So how far can light travel in a year? That term is what we call a light year. So 186,000 miles per second, zoom, for a year, that's how far light will travel in a year, a big distance. So now imagine we have the nearest star to the Earth is Alpha Centauri, I think there's an A and a B, or a portion of A and B, which is 4.37 light years away. Don't ask me how they measure that here. How can we even see 4.37 light years away? It's hard to imagine. But we can do it with the telescopes, the Hubble, and other things that we've got out in space already. All right, so kind of stay with me here for a second. So according to Einstein's theory of relativity, relativity, if we could travel at the speed of light, so if one of us gets in a spaceship, and the spaceship is able to travel at the speed of light, so it leaves Earth, boom, it's at the speed of light, going for 4.37 years at light speed, for 99.99999% at light speed, because we don't want to stop, because as closer you get to the speed of light, time slows down. So we're almost going at the speed of light, time is really getting slow, relative to what we're experiencing here on Earth. All right, so here's a, a bunch of math. So I asked Siri, you know, how many seconds in a year? 
31,556,952 seconds per year. And you can see my units up there, mm -hmm. seconds per year. And we're going to go for 4.37 years out, and then immediately we're going to turn around after we see Alpha Centauri and say, wow, cool, let's go back. Uh, 4.37 years coming back, so times two. And this 19.6 number, uh, I didn't come up with this, this is just something I saw on the web, so I don't know how accurate it is, but they had different speeds of light that if you were traveling at it, relative to Earth, this is how one second of time speeding almost at the speed of light, one second at the speed of light is roughly 19.6 hours here on Earth. All right, so then they asked Siri, how many hours in a year? 8,765.82 hours in a year. So you do all that math, if you were gone for 8.7 years on this Starship Enterprise, heading to Alpha Centauri and came back, it took you 8.74 years. But on Earth, your family is gone, our civilization is gone, or just completely different, because 617,000 years had elapsed here on Earth. Wow. So I don't know how fast Jesus ascended and went to heaven, but if he was going near the speed of light, he was gone, or not even at the speed of light, right? Because he could have gone a lot slower and be gone for two days and 2,000 years has passed on earth. <laughs> so if Einstein is right, half right, quarter right, whatever you want to say, uh, it's possible that Jesus ascended and was gone at really fast, Gone for two days, come back, it's 2,000 years that elapsed here on Earth. If this theory of relativity, relativity is somewhat accurate. But can you imagine being gone for less than nine years and coming back and the Earth is 617,000 years older? Wow. All right, so back to Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> that was just something I wanted to explore myself and see what it actually ended up being. Uh, that was kind of astounding. Verse 4, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Pretty famous scripture here, passage, that we have seen quoted in many a sermon, and I don't know if there's been books written on it, but actually there has been sort of books in the Bible written on them, and I'll get to that in just a second. So it says, Behold the proud. Behold the proud is referring to King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. Pretty much this whole book is the Lord replying to Habakkuk, referring to the Babylonians. So this refers to the period where King Nebuchadnezzar was walking around this palace. I mentioned this last week, and we even read uh, the passages of Scripture from Daniel chapter 4 last week. Um, and this is where Nebuchadnezzar was walking around his palace, pridefully stating, you know, how great his kingdom is. And mm, he immediately, not immediately, well, sort of immediately, uh, he gets uh, turned into a cow. Um, he is stricken with the condition of uh, boventhropy, I think is the way it's pronounced. And we talked a little bit about this um, uh, last week as well, where physiologically, even maybe psychologically, he thought and acted as a cow. So he was taken away from the humans and he was actually put in the fields for seven years uh, with the other beasts and his hair grew out and his nails grew out. Um, and there's other instances of this happening as well over the course of history, but King Nebuchadnezzar is the most famous case of this bone uh, that you would ever hear about. So let's go back to Daniel and read a little bit more now after these seven years have passed. So Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. And at the end of the time, at the end of these seven years, finally, he's been down on his hands and knees, acting in, like a cow, eating grass and other things like a cow. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven and I just have to wonder, you know, did he still have the mind? Did, did, was he thinking like a cow this whole time, or did he have human thoughts? He, I think he would have probably gone more crazy than what he thought he was if he could actually have human thoughts for these seven years, trapped in, a, in his own body by acting like a cow. So that's a different topic. But 
at some point he lifted his eyes to heaven. Could he, could he say, Lord, save me, Lord, help me, or something like that in his mind? But he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. So that, that's what it took. He lift, lifted up his eyes to God, and his understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And then verse 36 and 37. At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. So, not red letter Jesus text there, just me highlighting text in, in red just to point out you know, how this prideful man, um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he was put down. He recognizes how prideful he was. Um, and, and it's true to, through to this day that the, the proud will and can be uh, brought down. Uh, you know, we probably all had our own instances of acting or being prideful and over time, through whatever circumstance it might have been, that we were corrected or reproved or humbled uh, so that we wouldn't be as prideful, at least about a certain situation as we were. So we all eventually will get um, corrected. So this famous verse, uh, back to Habakkuk um, 2.4, you know, the just shall live by faith, by his faith. The books of the Bible that speak to portions of this, uh, I was listening to Pastor Chuck a little bit uh, as he taught on this, and he was saying, you know, uh, the first book where this same wording is mentioned is in Romans. So if you, if you wanted to or take notes, um, you know, Romans chapter 1 verse 17 is where uh, it talks a little bit about the just. And then in the book of uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 11, it talks about um, I said in my notes just you know a little bit about living but it's kind of a, a paraphrase and then in the Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 it talks about it, it's a, a, very much a chapter about faith but these three in the wording is exactly the same but the just shall live by his faith or the just shall live by faith in these three different books we don't know for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews, but we know uh, um, Paul wrote these other two books. And so, you know, there's speculation that maybe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I'm not going there. That's just speculation since uh, two of the other books use the same phrase from Habakkuk. That, you know, you can possibly connect the dots, but that's not the point of this uh, contention. Um, so justification in faith is through Jesus Christ. And then justification in faith and not of works uh, is kind of the, the main gist that we want to get out of uh, this small portion of Scripture here. The just shall live by faith. So a proud person, you know, we just got done, keep thinking in your mind of a proud person is, you know, just use the example of Nebuchadnezzar. A proud person relies on self, relies on power, relies on position and accomplishment. Whereas a righteous person relies or should rely on the Lord. Okay. Verse 5. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied, he gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all peoples. So in this scripture, it seems to imply... That drinking wine is or could be a precursor to becoming prideful. You know, it kind of takes us an out-of-body experience sometimes if we drink too much alcohol, wine. Uh, as most of us probably know, uh, you know, it, it can go to our head and just make us behave and act strange. Um, and it can make us become prideful, I'm sure. So wine drinking, though, that's what this verse is really talking about. Indeed, because he transgress, transgresses by wine, <coughs> wine drinking is condemned all through the minor prophets. 
Um, so one that's not considered a minor prophet is Chet, uh, Daniel. So if you wanted to um, look this up, you could look in Daniel chapter 5. It talks about wine drinking there. Uh, and then also with the minor prophets, Hosea chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't put these on a slide. But Hosea 4, 11, Joel 1, verse 5. Amos 2, verse 8, Micah 6, verse 15, and Nahum 1, verse 10. Then you don't have to write those down, but that's just an example of where I can find um, instances of wine being kind of condemned, um, at least drinking it in excess. Um, drunkenness and drinking wine were condemned in this era for probably good reasons, and a lot of the minor prophets, they picked up on that. And they, they spoke about it when they were prophesying. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, and Nahum. It was indicative that the nation had turned away from their God and the moral and ethical standards of the nation are crumbling. Um, and that's kind of what these minor prophets were uh, talking about, prophesying about, and they just possibly saw a correlation beside, between the, the moral decay and decline of the nation and the excess in wine drinking. I think is what they're trying to connect the dots with. The pride of man never has a place of satisfaction. Pride is a possible gateway to the life of sin. The righteous and the wicked alike can easily fall into the trap of wanting more and more, and it feels as if they can never be satisfied. So that's, that's also kind of the feeling. What I just described there was in a state of pridefulness. We just feel like we're right and we can never get enough of what we think is right. Same way with drinking wine. Uh, in this example, uh, a lot of times you, once you start to get that tipsy wine drinking feeling, you just possibly want more and more until you finally just had enough. But, so that again, the correlation is trying to be drawn there between uh, drunkenness or drinking of wine and pridefulness. And we can see here in our current day and age that social media uh, can be a trap uh, for many people. Uh, a lot of us hopefully can maintain and control uh, how we use social media, but it can be a trap because it exposes us to the luxuries and lifestyles of the rich and famous, and it's easy to, to fall into the trap of, well, what, what must it be like to be rich and famous and to have what they have, and it's so easy to see what they have with today's current uh, YouTube videos and social media, all of the famous people that we know have IG accounts, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all these different a uh, avenues for us to keep tabs on exactly what they're doing almost each and every day. So verse 6. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say woe to him who increases what is not his? How long? And to him who lo loads himself with many pledges. So here is the, the first scriptures, first scripture verse in this book that uses the term woe. So this is the first of five different woes in this chapter two. So one translation uh, I noticed uses the word oi, you know, O Y. Um, is it the King James or is it a different? Mm -hmm. But this must have been a different version than I was just looking at it. Instead of woe, it uses O-Y, oi. So like, oi, or whatever I probably used to hear that word. I can't even remember what, if there was a TV show that used that, or if it was Popeye or somebody <laughs> um, used to use that word oi in, in, in place of woe. So these woes, these five different woes that we're going to read about, um, are oracles of judgment usually consisting of two parts. So the first part of these woes is usually a, a declaration of a wrong that um, God is going to be pointing out to Habakkuk. And then the second part of this woe is typically a notice of impending judgment. So we have a declaration of the wrong and then also what the impending judgment is going to be. So this is where God says, woe to you. Stop doing what you're doing. Here comes, here's the declaration, here's what I'm saying to you is wrong, and here's the upcoming impending judgment. The judgment usually applies the principle of the law of retaliation. 
a wrong could come back to the to haunt the wrongdoer. So retaliation was usually, you know, the, the eye for an eye, a hand for a hand. These were the like the maximum sentences that were ever supposed to be done uh, back in the day. Um, so a wrong could come back to haunt the wrongdoer. And then at the very end of this verse, we see the word pledges. Pledges are mentioned in this verse, and in the, in the King James, we see the word pledges written as a, a completely different words. Um, I'm sure Steve, is, in his Bible, it says, as thick clay. So if you read that in the King James, thick clay, and then in the New King James, it changes it completely to pledges. So what's the understanding or meaning of this. Well, again, back in the day, back in this time frame, the days of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and these cultures, uh, would write out their, their contracts or their uh, transactions that were they were making with people. You know, they didn't have Microsoft Excel, they didn't have a, a little skin notebook that they carried around with them to take notes in and stuff. They wrote all this stuff down on clay tablets. So these clay tablets were their way of keeping track of all the, of the different pledges. Um, and pledges were basically the practice of giving something as a guarantee for repayment, which was permitted under the law, uh, but with limitations to ensure the humane treatment of people. So if you took a pledge from somebody, back in the day, you would, they would write it down on a clay tablet. Because um, a lot of times they would have, I don't know if they were using actual numbers for amounts or a person's name or imprinted on the clay tablet. They knew who it was from and what the amount was or what the pledge was. Uh, that's, that's how they um, would load himself up with many pledges or load himself up with many clay tablets collecting all of, the, all of the, these different uh, guarantees of repayment from people essentially is what we're seeing here. So he's saying woe to him about this, about increasing wrongly through other people's Not misfit, but I can't think of the right word. Verse 7. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty. So in verse 7, the Hebrew term for creditors has the idea of, uh, again, I like that the Hebrew always has kind of like a word picture of what certain words mean. So creditors has the word picture of those who bite. So, <laughs> those who bite. Uh, suggesting sudden, sudden and hurtful attacks, possibly. So here we see the, that the judgment of those that load themselves with many pledges will eventually run the risk of being overthrown themselves and becoming the booty or the treasure of those that they once suppressed or conquered. So again, the Lord is saying, be careful, Babylonians. Your creditors, the people that you conquered at one point or another, beware, they're going to actually rise up and conquer you and uh, take you away eventually. And again, as all great civilizations and nations, uh, they don't stay in power forever. Um, this is off topic, but you know, the United States, the fact that we've been around for 230 plus years now as a nation is not typical. Um, are we nearing the end of our greatest nation on earth a title? Who knows? We may still have many decades to go or so before we lose that title, if we lose that title. Who knows what's going to happen? But a lot of civilizations have roughly a two-century or 200-year timeline uh, that there has been books written about this and how uh, many great civilizations, they just kind of have a, 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 they rise up and they stay in power for roughly right around 200 years plus or minus and then they collapse and someone else takes over. Um, and, we, and we see that in scripture as well. So, verse 8, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and all who dwell in it. The idea is that soon or eventually the places and peoples that you've plundered, again speaking about the Babylonians, will again rise up and plunder you. Examples of this were the perennial enemies of Israel and Judah, uh, which were Edom, 
and this is not the total list, but we know that Edom was an enemy of Israel and Judah, as was two other nations that I've already mentioned, Assyria and Babylon. Mm -hmm. And in the Minor Prophets, we have Obadiah, who prophesies and condemns Edom. And we have the book that we just finished, Nahum, condemns Assyria, and we have Habakkuk that condemns Babylon. So we have this idea of nations coming into power and then declining out of power and being plundered themselves by some other up-and-coming nation. With evil gains for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. So here is the second of the five woes that we're going to read. The evil gain is referring to gaining property through extortion, and this abuse of power was strictly prohibited in the law of Moses. And it mentions here uh, that he may set his nest on high. The only thing that I can uh, come up with here that I, I think makes sense is that you know, just as birds, uh, they build their nests high in a tree typically, or as high as they're able, and away from <coughs> civilization, away from people, as much as they're able. Um, and basically high and away from people and predators. So that's the benefit of being able to fly. They can build a nest pretty much anywhere above 10 feet out of human reach, out of most predators' reach, and they, and they feel safe doing that. So that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. So that's why a bird built his nest up high. And also the rich, um, they were in the habit of trying to avoid threats to their fortune as well, so that they, they would do things oftentimes to protect themselves from being plundered, but uh, the Lord is um, saying, you know, it's going to happen. Woe to him who covets evil gains, which is certainly what the Babylonians were in the practice of doing, uh, obtaining and gaining things wrongfully. Just, they just plundered and conquered at will. 10 and 11. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples, and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. So the whole structure of Israel's society was calling out for justice. This is what Habakkuk wanted, and he knew of so many instances of, in people that were just being wrongfully abused. And he just wanted justice. If you go back to the first five verses in chapter 1, we talk, or Habakkuk talks about how justice was being perverted and how it was not able to do things properly because of the wicked people that were kind of in control of the justice system there in Judah <coughs> at the time. And then we see kind of the, this last part of the verse where it talks about the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Answer it. So kind of figuratively speaking here, of the stones in the fortresses that Babylon had built. Uh, you know, just like um, Nineveh in Assyria had a tremendous fortress there, so did the Babylonians. And the Lord is kind of saying here that the stones will cry out from the wall, and even the, the beam from the timbers in, in the wall or in the structure will cry out against them. And this is similar to just as the stones would cry out that Jesus referred to in Luke 9, 40. So Luke 19, I'm sorry, not 9, but Luke 19, verse 40. They would cry out if his disciples hadn't said what they said. Because the disciples were saying certain things, and the Pharisees were telling Jesus to tell his disciples to stop saying what they were doing, saying. And even Jesus turned to the Pharisees and said, you know, if, if I were to stop them or prevent them from saying what they're saying, even these stones, he said, would cry out. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, this illusion in um, 10 and 11 of Habakkuk chapter 2, is that he's saying that these stones would even cry out, and the beams and the timbers would answer as well. Verse 12. Woe to him who builds a town with bloodshed, who establishes a city by iniquity. Here is the third of the five woes. The Babylonians would build towns 
to put all of the displaced people that they conquered. They didn't just go in and pillage and conquer and kill everybody. They didn't wipe out man, woman, and child completely, although they did kill a lot of the people. Um, so they ended up with you know, uh, strays, and they ended up with probably women and children. I'm guessing they killed most of the men. Um, so there were all of these displaced people that they would build a town, essentially through their bloody wars, their conquest, through their bloodshed. And, and there's also instance in another minor prophet, uh, Micah, who also spoke against the leaders of Judah who were developing the city and kingdom at the expense of humane treatment of others. So, Micah was kind of pointing out the leaders of Judah, maybe not as wicked as the Babylonians, but they were kind of still doing the same thing. Uh, they weren't building towns of displaced people, they were just using the, the probably the poorer people, um, people there in Judah, to, to do a lot of the city and kingdom building projects. Uh, kind of maybe like treating them somewhat like a slave or an indentured servant. Verse 13 and 14. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the peoples labor to feed the fire, and nations weary themselves in vain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In verse 13, it is not of God or part of God's perfect plan that the people should be forced to labor to feed uh, the development and to weary themselves in vain. So this whole idea of forced labor to cause people, someone that uh, for whatever reason doesn't have a, a job or they're just need money for one reason or another, so they're kind of forced into this indentured servitude. Uh, it, it's not of the Lord, it's not His perfect plan that they should be forced into this labor to, to, to build. So that's verse 13, but then verse 14 is kind of unique, it kind of stands out from the first, from verse 1 of chapter 1 all the way up to verse 13 of chapter 2, because it's kind of like a uh, so-called island in the middle of this judgment on Babylon. Remember, Habakkuk is kind of seeing all of this, all of these evil things and all these things that are going to happen uh, in a vision from God, basically about the judgment on Babylon. The knowledge... Uh, I had another sentence in here that I was going to read, but it's kind of out of context. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord speaks of the full manifestation of God's person, of His significance, of His presence, and His wonder. The true knowledge of God in the time of His kingdom on earth will be like the waters that cover the sea, which are, you can imagine, the waters of any lake, of any sea, of any ocean. They're all embracing, they're inescapable, and they're fully enveloping. So where it says the the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Um, I, I couldn't, again, I was listening to Pastor Chuck, and as he was talking about this verse, he just waxed so poetically about this one verse for a few minutes. And unless I was just trying to type it all out and read it verbatim the way he did it, uh, I can't. But he just said it so eloquently. But this is... An amazing instance, like the knowledge. The earth is going to be filled with the knowledge. You know, back in Genesis chapter 3, um, verse 5, Satan fraudulently promised all of us great knowledge. He wasn't able to deliver on that, but God will. And that's kind of what Pastor Chuck was bringing out here, is God is going to give us knowledge. It's just going to fill the earth. We're going to eventually, you know, after the second coming, we're going to just know everything when we get to heaven. And things are just going to be revealed to us. It's going to be like, we'll be like Einstein. We'll be better and more knowledgeable than Einstein. We'll know so much more than we do now. Um, and that's an understatement. Um, but this, this verse here is kind of where the tide turns a little bit, where there's so much good that the Lord drops into this verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And again, Pastor Chuck just really 
spoke so eloquently about the glory of the Lord. Um, I wish I could just rephrase it in such a way that it did it justice, but I don't think I could. <laughs> so, verse 15. Here's the fourth of the five woes. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look at his na nakedness. So wow, another condemnation uh, this woe is to those that would force or coerce another person to drink with them with the express purpose to make them drunk, just so that you can look upon their shame. So hopefully none of us have a person in our life that is trying to do this to us. If you do, run, Forrest, run, run the other way. But the idea is, you know, just be very careful. Uh, we talk, talked about drinking wine and few minutes ago, um, but if you have somebody that's, I mean, this is pretty frank and pretty direct, woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. So if you have someone that's always inviting you over to have a drink, or have a drink, have a drink, to do this and that and the other thing, um, you, you may want to look elsewhere for a different friend. <laughs> um, it's hard to tell what their motives might be. Uh, are they just, uh, are they trying to see you fall? Are they trying to get you to a point where you make a mistake and then they can look upon your nakedness or your, your shame, essentially. Who knows what their motives may be. So, verse 16. You are filled with shame instead of glory. You also drink and be exposed as uncircumcised. The cup of the Lord's right hand will be turned against you and utter shame will be on your glory. So being exposed as uncircumcised which was to show that the Babylonians were kind of outside of what we call God's covenant. Or in other words, they were not part of God's people, uh, nor recipients of God's mercy. Uh, and also we see here that the cup of the Lord's right hand represents the wrath of God. It will be turned against you, and our shame will be on your glory. Verse 17. For the violence done in Lebanon will cover you, and the plunder of beasts which made them afraid, because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. The violence done in Lebanon is possibly referring to the city of Tyre uh, that was so uh, violently besieged by King Nebuchadnezzar for 13 years. Um, I didn't really know what else to, to bring up on this verse except for that. Tyre was a, an, an island coastal city uh, in present-day Lebanon that was a, a great place of mercantile business that was there for many, many years. So apparently King Nebuchadnezzar tried to conquer it, uh, besieged it for 13 years. Uh, some say he did conquer it, and other people say he didn't conquer it completely. Um, and then I believe it was finally flattened and just kind of raked into the sea almost by Alexander the Great many years later, and it was pretty much left uninhabited for a very, very long time. At least now we know where the city is at, because we've excavated and found, um, you know, the actual, almost like a, a pier of rubbish that was drug into the sea there uh, along the coast, and how flat the land is, because it literally just scraped it clean. So I think that's what this verse 17 is referring to, because King Nebuchadnezzar did besiege Tyre, we know for at least 13 years. Um, so that's what it, uh, I think, is talking about here. Verse 18. So what profit is the image that its maker should carve it, the molded image, a teacher of lies, that the maker of its mold should trust in it to make mute idols, or idols that can't speak? So worshiping a carved image has got to be probably what I consider one of the stupidest things uh, that man has ever done. There's so many instances of it in Scripture that it was just amazing that you know that we that we did this. But Isaiah um, probably is uh, one of the best purveyors or, of what he really thought uh, about this uh, practice as well. And he, I don't think he uses the word stupid anywhere in his Scripture in his wording, but it pretty much equates it to stupidity. Um, so he alludes to you know a, a man going into a forest, cutting down a tree, and dragging that tree back to his village, to his city, and he would take 
an axe and chop it into a, a chunk or two, and out of that chunk, he would carve himself an idol. And then he would get it in the shape or form that he would want, and he would put it on a wagon, a cart, because it can't walk, and he would take it down to his local goldsmith, coppersmith, get it overlaid with gold or silver or both, and then put it back on the cart and bring it back to his house, set it up on a table, maybe made out of that same tree that he drug in from the forest, so that he can worship it. And it doesn't say anything, it's mute. It can't see anything, it can't smell anything, it doesn't they can't walk or do anything. And then while he was carving, I forgot to mention, you know, while he was carving that idol out of that chunk of wood from that tree that he drug into the forest, those shavings and stuff and those little branches, he took some of that and he, and he threw them into the fire to keep himself warm. But then he took another piece of that same tree that he built the idol out of and he chopped it up into wood chunks to throw it into his oven to make him bread that he can eat. So hopefully you're starting to see the absurdity of you know all of this different things that he, he did with this tree trunk were all from the same piece of wood, yet he considered one piece of wood to be so elevated, worthy of worship, and treating like a god that he called it an idol. Um, again, when you kind of look at it, and Isaiah said it much more plainly and clearly and uh, vibrantly than, than what I just did, but you get the idea that it's just stupid. <laughs> To, to think that this one same tree, uh, that different pieces of wood can be used for different purposes, yet one of those can be so highly esteemed that we idolize it and worship it. So be careful of idolatry. Idolatry begins with deception. Idolatry encourages deception. And idolatry calls for a commitment to deception. It's something that I, I saw also in a, in a commentary that I thought was really good kind of definition, per se, of idolatry. Verse 19. And the fifth of the final five woes. Woe to him who says to wood, Awake, to silent stone, arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. That's kind of what I just alluded to a little bit there in my story of what you could do with all the different chunks of wood from the same fallen tree. So here God is pointing out the folly of idolatry in this woe that speaks to the wood or stone, for anybody that speaks to the wood or, or stone idols. Our culture nowadays would not make an idol, hopefully, out of wood or stone, but we do worship something else that we all probably have in our pockets right now. Uh, that we idolize and we worship, a lot of people do at least, you know, mammon or money. Um, so that's, a, that, that's more of a typical form of idolatry, you know, because we have all, you know, it's, it, you can always, you can pick up on it from, you know, you meet somebody new here in church or in the grocery store and you ask them, uh, what do you do? What's the first thing that they do is they try to explain what they do at work and what they do at work is how their their way of making money, essentially. Um, it, it all kind of comes back to money. And if you're talking to friends or you're talking to somebody in general, they'll eventually topics will get around to our possessions. Um, you know, a, a, a house, a car, a boat, a motorcycle, blah, 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 fill in the blank. It all kind of sort of comes back to what can you purchase with your money. Um, and it's all about gathering and getting as much money. There's nothing wrong with money. That's a whole different topic that we're not going to talk about now. Money is just a tool. It's amoral. Um, it, it's neither good nor bad. It's a tool um, that we can use. Um, so, you know, Dave Ramsey says, you know, it, it's okay to have money, just don't let have money have you. Meaning you need to be in control of it. You need to understand what it's there for and use it wisely and properly. So, I haven't had a life lesson until now, I and mean, I had one last week, and so here's the only life lesson for this week. What you give the greatest part of your life to is what you worship. What you give the greatest part of your life to is what you worship. Just think on that for a second. And there may be a couple things that you know that are pretty elevated in your life. You know, is it your children? Is it your spouse? 
Is it your job? Is it Jesus? Go on and on and on, all these different things in our life. What's at the top of your list? That's essentially what we worship. It's just something to, to ponder. Is that order of things that you may come up with in the proper sequence? Is it in the proper order? If Jesus is not there at the top of the list, maybe some changes are warranted. Verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. <clears throat> the greatest threat of America is probably not ICBMs or ISIS or North Korea. The greatest threat of America is that there is no longer any fear of God. Um, we have misinterpreted possibly our own history as well. <clears throat> we think we are the greatest nation on earth. Uh, because of our entre entrepreneurial spirit, maybe. Maybe because of our wisdom in business. Uh, because of our application, or appreciation, I should say, of freedom. We were, for centuries, the greatest nation on earth when we believed in the Ju Judeo-Christian ethic. We understood right from wrong in our behavior, and there was a fear of God in the hearts of our forefathers. So only 230 three years ago, we had a fear of God in every living man, woman, and child in America, so much more so than we do now. So it's important to, to realize that things have changed, um, and we're still in a position where we can make a positive impact on those that we come in contact with. If we keep remembering, but the Lord is in His holy temple rightfully where he needs to be, things can continue to go on and, and be okay. But with what I just said there, the greatest hope for America now, hope, is for revival. Now, there's been talk of a revival for, for years. You know, is there going to be uh, some sort of future revival? You know, Greg Glory goes on his crusades and uh, has awesome outturnings of, of people coming to those coliseums getting full, amphitheaters getting full of people coming to the Lord. Those are great. I mean, that's, you know, just like back in 2 Peter 3, 9, you know, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. He wants everybody to come to repentance. So, every person that gets saved is just one more person closer to the Lord's second coming. Um, so, the greatest hope for America now is for revival. Revival will lead to more people coming to know the Lord, more people coming to know the Lord, uh, it's great because that's going to draw us closer and closer to that Lord's second coming. So just remember, no matter how bad things may seem, if you're having a bad day, if you're feeling prideful, if you are being hurt by somebody else that's being prideful, just try to remember that the Lord is in His holy temple. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time and how, how quickly it always seems to go by. And Lord, I pray that there's some passage of scripture there, uh, Lord, that we can all uh, glean from, and um, thank you, Lord, for you know, preserving your word over the, uh, these 2,000 plus years, and how these instances and of things that, have gone, that went on so long ago can still speak to us today, and Lord, I ask that you would uh, just uh, open our hearts to your word uh, each and every time we uh, open our Bibles. Lord, continue to draw us to you that we want to open up your Bibles each and every day and spend time reading more about history, in essence, of people even before our forefathers that loved you so much and they, they tried to follow you and um, some of them did it wonderfully well and others fell flat on, our, on their face just as many of us today do it wonderfully well and some of us fall flat on our face. Lord, again, things haven't changed a whole lot in 2,000 plus years. And so help us, Lord, to continue to reach out to you in our, our daily uh, studies, in our prayer time. And Lord, just uh, go before us and 
Help us to, to be wise like Habakkuk, to, to ask questions, to ponder things, and then also to be ready for reproof if, if it needs to come our way. Um, help us, Lord, to be the opposite of prideful. Uh, help us, Lord, to, to speak into someone's life if, if we feel that they're being prideful in a, in a loving way. And just like asking questions are, are great, um, I think, all the time, if they're done in a loving way. Lord, just to continue to allow us to grow wiser uh, each and every day. And Lord, just thank you again for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen.